Okay, so uh, again, welcome everyone uh, to Paper Club. And today we're going to be talking about uh, one of the most famous papers in the recent years, uh, which is BERT. And uh, BERT is a is a language model, and is that and uh, and BERT stands for bidirectional encoder representations from transformers. And uh, one of the interesting things about BERT, which uh, uh, which I think it is, is worth noting, is that BERT itself is not an architecture. BERT is a is a training um, it's a training regime. So BERT is a transformer, and uh, we've spoken about transformers uh, before in Paper Club. With uh, attention is all you need, and they do say this in the paper. BERT is basically this implementation only the left side of the of the transformer so there's no decoder it's only an encoder but it is just that it is a, a transformer what's interesting about BERT is how it sees at the natural language processing literature and how it tries to advance the state of the art and and also stay versatile so as we will see in the paper uh, BERT advances something like 11 state of the art uh, something like 11 uh, tasks in in NLP just by being clever at, about they uh, about how they train their model and then allowing the model to be fine tuned across uh, almost any task that you can imagine but as we will also see you don't need to fine tune bird you can also use it off the shelf so to speak and it will also have a very interesting performance so let's get let's get let's get to it. And uh, so I would like to do a, a brief recap of the motivation uh, for this paper. So that I think that we, we've uh, we've spoken about this a lot in um, in Paper Club. But uh, the the beginning of or the the real beginning of natural language processing was with uh, with the introduction of word embeddings, right? Um, and word embeddings they were introduced by Michael. Oh, by the way, I'm going to use a few resources throughout the um throughout throughout the, the the presentation i'm going to put all the links at the end i'm going to put them in the github repo uh, i can also post them in the chat if you want uh so if if you'd like to just uh stay a bit longer and uh, i'll put all the all the links in the chat uh cool so yeah so speaking of word embeddings uh mikolov they uh, Mikolov and, and, and his colleagues, uh, they introduced the first word embeddings model uh, or some of the first word embedding models which were uh, broadly general, generalizable and that was word to vec And of course word to vec has the advantage of, of being a bit of a, of a generic language model. It's uh, it, the, the task that, that, that it's trained to solve is, is generic enough that you have very meaningful embeddings. But of course the main issue that they have is that you can only use them as they are. So once they are trained, uh, they they are at their final stage. They are not because of how they are trained, which is uh, roughly speaking. I don't know if you can see my script. So which is roughly speaking. Uh, can I see this? Okay. So roughly speaking, uh, you have two modalities. So you have CBAO and Skipgram. So they are either trained with the context to predict the word that you want to to predict uh, the, the center word, or they are fed the center word and try to predict the context. And because of the very specific training, you cannot fine tune them, which means that if you have a different task that you want to solve, which is not just that, you have to take the embeddings and put them through a different architecture. Uh, that is not entirely bad. A lot of uh, natural language processing tasks were solved in that, in that manner. But again, it's it's not ideal. So and and also, if you wanted to to represent something bigger than a word, some uh, such as sentences and paragraphs, then you have to do something clever with the embeddings, either sum them or concatenate them or or average them, and that that brings uh, some issues. So along came the idea of paragraph and sentence embeddings again by Mikolov and 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 his and his group, but. That also came with a, it, it couldn't be fine tuned. It was uh, just, well, once you train them, that's it. And it came with, with, a, with a ton of performance issues because the paragraph embeddings, they need to be trained at inference time as well. 
so um, no. so you can't just so 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 it can be very slow to get paragraph embeddings especially if you have a ton of sentences or a ton, or a ton of paragraphs that you want to to infer on so with this in mind uh, the next step in natural language processing was using LSTMs which took this idea of embeddings of uh, word embeddings and said how can we uh, efficiently make uh, representations of paragraphs or sentences and the idea is well you, you have your pre-trained word embeddings and then you pass them through an LSTM uh, and the LSTM gives you a hidden state and that hidden state embeds the whole sentence and uh, you can use that hidden state to make other predictions uh, the I want to say arguably one of the most popular such architectures was Elmo so we can see Elmo here and what's interesting about Elmo so what was interesting about Elmo is that it gave you a hidden representation for every token so you would say uh, if you if these are all the input tokens in your sentence all the input embeddings Elmo will use two LSTMs one one that goes left to right and the other one that goes right to left and it will concatenate both of the embeddings so uh, what they, the, the way they call this in Elmo is that this is a, a contextual representation of the embedding, right? So it's not just the embedding of the word as trained on a, on a random corpus, but they are taking the representation of the word, of the word and including the context. Uh, the main issue, uh, or at least what, what, uh, what Bert is trying to solve is that this doesn't fully take the left to right and, and right to left attention into account meaning that usually when we see a sentence we use information from the whole sentence to uh, uh, to interpret the meaning of of, of, of this sentence so uh, of course Elmo was very successful in in several uh, in several tasks but it is argued that well it actually captures left to right and right to left but that is not the same as capturing uh, the whole sentence at the same time and the other problem is that well Elmo is just uh, a, an input to whatever new architecture you have so uh, the embeddings are not trained during Elmo only the LSTM parameters uh, and it's a feature-based approach so you you get the Elmo parameters and you don't fine-tune them to your specific task you just get your Elmo representations and uh, you input that to a different architecture that is there to solve your problem so with that in mind, the, the next uh, step was to use transformers to, uh, so to use transformers to do this. And the first was to use transformers to solve uh, NLP tasks was uh, OpenAI and they introduced uh, uh, GPT. And GPT is a, is a transformer. So again, uh, this exact uh, encoder nature, uh, but the, encoder is only allowed to attend from left to right and the intuition behind this was uh, was fair meaning that well if you want to uh, this was with a next token prediction in mind so if you want to predict the next word in the sentence of course you can't uh, you can't think of uh, taking uh, you can't think of of looking words into the future because then the task becomes trivial so OpenAI was, uh, so GPT is only allowed to, to see everything previous to the, to the token that you're trying to, to predict. Uh, so that's, that's, how, uh, that's how transformers came into the, into the world, into the world of, of natural language processing. And BERT, which is what is proposed here, is exactly the same architecture as GPT, except that the transformers are allowed to look at everything so they're allowed to look at the whole sentence or the whole paragraph or or the whole sequence that you're trying to uh that you're trying to to perform a task on uh we'll see that this comes with uh with some um with some tweaks that are required during during learning but uh, i think that for bird what's most interesting is actually how they uh how they set up the whole learning procedure so it would be generic enough and so that it would learn uh, so let's get into BERT. Um, so just a brief reminder of what the transformer does and how it, uh, so how it comes into BERT. Uh, okay. 
So I'm going to, okay. So if you haven't, so I'm going to, again, put a link to this guide on, on, on uh, about the transformer, but this is uh, one of the best ways to understand transformers if you, if you haven't done so yet. So uh, the inputs to our, to our transformer, uh, so we, we're going to skip the position encoding. We're going to come in here uh, for, for BERT. And the input to the transformer is going to be an embedding. So a token embedding. Uh, if you, uh, so if we look at the illustrated transformer, uh, the way the transformer can do sequences of, of arbitrary lengths is because of all the matrix multiplications that happen in between. So if this is our input embedding, for a word, so one row is going to be one embedding, and then you have n examples on, on this row, so you can have the whole sentence here stacked on top of each other. You have a matrix that calculates, so you have a matrix that calculates your, your values, your, your keys and your queries. These are all trainable parameters. And as you can see here, the outer di dimension is maintained. So the, the direction that goes through the examples is maintained. So you have no problem processing all the tokens in one in one go. Uh, the next step in the transformer is, uh, so it, it, it goes into this scaled uh, dot product attention, which is what happens here. And as you can see, the again, the outer dim dimension is maintained. When you multiply these two matrices, the outer dimension is maintained. And then when you multiply it against, uh, against V, the outer dimension is maintained. So, Still, you have all your examples in the same matrix multiplication uh, uh, pass of the transformer. And this is very important because uh, what we'll see is that BERT is massive. So being able to do uh, batch operations is going to be very important. Uh, then the next trick of the transformer is that, well, this is not just one head, it's several heads. And then you concatenate them and apply, again, a linear transformation with learned weights. And I think it's easy to see that, again, this is your dimension. Here are all your heads concatenated. Here's your batch dimension. And you multiply it against this massive uh, matrix to reduce it back to the size of the model. And you, again, you preserve the outer dimension. And then this goes into an, into an NLP, uh, an MLP. So again, the outer dimension is always preserved. And you just stack layers on top of each other. And if you are clever about your about about the shape of this matrix, you don't. Uh, all the layers are just clones of each other, but each one with individual training parameters. So hopefully that's clear how the how one embedding so one sentence is going to uh, propagate through a transformer. If there is a question about it, this would be a good time to ask it. No. Good. Um, so I guess the only other important thing about the embeddings is that these embeddings are trainable with BERT. So you will have a lookup matrix, um, and this matrix is going to be trained as the rest of the transformer is trained. Cool. Uh, ta -ta, where are we? Okay. So that is so that is. BERT, basically. BERT is a transformer that propagates embeddings throughout the, uh, through the layers, and then it puts an output, output representation. So what, what is this first layer? So uh, when they are training the transformer, they need uh, to specify uh, the inputs so that the transformer will actually learn uh, something from them. Because it has, so because as you can see uh, here, I can show you down here better. So as you can see here, so as you okay, as you can see here, the uh, every transformer layer has attention over the whole sequence that you're trying to uh, to do a task on. The problem with this is that because it has attention over everything, it has no way of knowing uh, which token comes first and which token comes second and third and so on. Uh, so to uh, to do that, our input embeddings, they are not just going to be the token embeddings. Uh, we're going to add uh, an also learned embedding, which is going to represent uh, the position of the, of the token in, the, in, your, in your sequence. 
so that's the first extra step that we need for training is uh, make a sequence of the same length as your as your input sequence, but which contain learned, learned embeddings for each of the of the positions in the uh, in the sequence. And the second step, uh, it has to do with how BERT is trained. And uh, BERT is trained on pairs of sentences. So you're going to have one sentence, a separator character, and then another sentence. And we're going to have two tasks that are going to be learned at the same time. The first task is going to be what they called a masked language model. And what this means is that uh, with some with some probability, they will replace a token with a mask, which means it's just uh, we don't know what it is, and they will ask the the model to to predict which is this word, uh, which uh, which word it is. Now this creates a mismatch between training and prediction because when you're trying to predict, you do not have any mask tokens. You usually have the whole sentence, and then you want the the embeddings for it. So also with some probability, they don't change anything. And with some other probability, they change it to a random token. And the other task that, that it has to learn is called next sentence prediction. So basically, you have these two sentences that go into, uh, actually, it's easier to see it in the appendix. Uh, OK. So this is the first task, which uh, if this is your input sequence, it will mask it with some probability, it will change the word with some probability, or it will not do anything uh, with some probability. And the, sec the second uh, prediction is uh, the second task that the transformer needs to learn is you get two sentences. The man, the man went to the store, he bought a gallon of milk, and you have to say if uh, this sentence is, uh, follows this sentence. So in this case, yes, uh, the man uh, went to the store. Uh, penguins are flightless birds, uh, so it's not next. And the way this is done is that you get a, trans a transformation for this CLS character, which marks the beginning of the sentence. And Carlos, the, yeah. can I ask a question about the, the masks? Yeah. Because uh, I found this a bit, uh, not strange, but uh, maybe strange because in the original uh, attention paper, uh, attention mm -hmm. or unit paper, there was mm -hmm. no need for masks. Is it because it was a uh, autoencoder or what's, well, well why uh, do we need it here but not there? The need of the mask here is because you are, tr you need to, so, so you need to learn the, the embedding representations somehow, right? So if you don't have, so, so the idea is that the the transformer is learning the semantics of the of the language. So, by asking the transformer to predict this word, it needs to understand from the whole context what word needs to go here. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. Um. It's just a learning. It's just a, a learning a way of learning a language model. Uh, it is also yeah. important to say that it's not the first, so most language models are trained to predict the next word in the sentence, right? So most language models would, would get the man went to and then what's the next word? So what they say is that, well, since, uh, since the transformer has attention over the whole thing, it doesn't make sense to make it predict the last one. It makes sense that to predict any random token in the sentence. Um, ah, so in the in the attention all you need paper, in the transformer paper, they didn't mm -hmm. uh, train any language models there? No. In the, in the experiments, I see. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Thanks. No worries. Um, okay. So, yeah, so you introduce this uh, CLS, which is a, a special token that just puts the, the beginning, and then the output of this is going to be used to do the next sentence prediction. So you put a, a an MLP layer on top of this, and you say, and you ask, or a, I think they, they do a just a simple regression, a logistic regression, uh, and it tells you to predict. Okay, is is the next sentence or not the next sentence? And you uh, and you and you take the cross entropy loss. 
And you also have this SEP uh, characters, which mark the end of the sentences, just again, because, because the model is attending over the whole, over the whole sequence, you can't really tell if, uh, where, where a sentence begins and ends. And that brings us to the next, uh, let's say, cartwheels that they uh, put on BERT, which is that you also have segment embeddings. And the segment embeddings, again, they are learned and they tell, so they are added to the, to the token embeddings just to say which tokens belong to the first sentence and which belong to the second sentence. And there's an interesting thing here, which is that they deliberately say, we use two sentences to train, but that is not necessarily how you, can, how you have to use it. You can use uh, the model with only one sentence. So this is just a training mechanism because they need this to train this CLS. Uh, but you can use a single sentence and build your, your, your prediction task on top of that. Uh, okay, so that is the training. Uh, there is another detail about training, which is how they tokenize. So they tokenize using this uh, word piece uh, tokenizer. And uh, we will see later, I have an example, but basically uh, word pieces are two-step tokenizer. So first they, they get individual tokens and then they, they do a process called stemming. A stemming means that you take only the root of the word and then you have these uh, special characters. Here it's berries, but it's more, um, more likely to be, uh, if, you, if you, let's say you want to embed tokenizer, tokenizing, um, tokens and so on. So the, the stem is going to be token and all the ING, ER and all the terminations, they are going to have their own embedding. And what that does is it reduces massively the size of your vocabulary. And that's how they get away with having a vocabulary of 30,000 tokens and, uh, and still getting a very rich language model. So there is a paper for, for, for word piece uh, for how to do word piece tokenization, uh, but that's, uh, that's outside the scope of this paper. Other questions about the, the training mechanism? No? Cool. So here comes the nice part. If you think you can train BERT, uh, you are, I want to say you are fooling yourself. <laughs> so BERT was trained on 16 TPU chips uh, for BERT base and 16 TPUs for BERT large. So we have two sizes of models and it took four days to complete the training. And these are Google researchers and they have access to all these TPUs. Uh, for us lay people who don't have access to TPUs, uh, training a model like BERT is not feasible. Why you need so many resources, you ask? Well, because the transformers, because of how many matrix operations there are in the transformers and how many attention heads you can stack up, the number of parameters explodes very quickly. So as you can see, you have three times this matrix, which as we'll see, the, uh, what they call the hidden size is going to be quite large. You need this matrix as well. You need the, the feed forward uh, matrix as well. So, and then you have to multiply it by the number of heads, you have to multiply by the number of layers, it, it explodes very quickly. So bird base, where is it? Uh, okay. So, okay, so bird base, which they designed just so that they could show that a, a bird model with the same size of open AI's GPT uh, can perform better, has 110 million parameters. And if that doesn't sound like much, I can assure you it is a lot of parameters. And BERT large, which is what they say is their best performing model, has 340 million parameters. So uh, training this on a normal GPU would take forever and uh, I wouldn't recommend it. And they don't recommend it either. So, Uh, what is, so we have a, sorry, we have a question asking what is the difference between word piece and fast text uh, that also use chunk words into subwords. 
Uh, to be honest, I don't know the exact difference. Um, yeah, so, sorry, I don't know the exact difference, but I guess it's just in the way that they that they perform the the tokenization. So how they find the stems and which are the 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 completion tokens. Um, so yeah, sorry, I don't have a, a more straight answer for you. Uh, cool. So yeah, so a lot of parameters, a long time to train. So the way they actually expect you to use training is by expect you to use BERT is by doing fine tuning, which means that you download the model that they have pre-trained. So BERT base, BERT large, and then you add a single layer or, or, or you, you add a few layers on top of your BERT architecture. So basically you have your same BERT architecture with all the trainable parameters and you add something on top of it. Uh, whatever it whatever it needs to be, uh, you add it on top of it, and then you train the whole thing. Uh, so you train whatever small model you have on top plus BERT, and what they argue is that you can reach state of the art performance with only a few epochs of training, uh, which is quite impressive. So uh, let's look a little bit about what kind of things you can do. So this general language understanding evaluation is uh, is is a benchmark for natural language processing and they have a ton of tasks and the idea is to get the best average. So not performing good at any one, but uh, do the best average. I'm not going to go through all of them because, uh, well, I think a few, just one or two is enough to, um, uh, is enough to, uh, to, to show the versatility of birds. So for example, this multi-genre natural language inference uh, the goal is to predict whether one sentence is entailment, contradiction, or or neutral with respect to the first one. So what they do is they feed the sentences. So sentence one, separator, sentence two, with all the embeddings and so on. And then they put a simple classifier on top of uh, on top of this CLS. And this is where it becomes important. Uh, this CLS embedding because they say. CLS embedding is going to be the sequence representation. So it's, it's not going to be the embedding of a token, but it's going to learn to represent the whole sequence. But this token is useless unless fine tuned. So whatever you want to do, you need to fine tune if you want to put any meaning to that. And that's what they do with MN, uh, with uh, when they need a, a, a sequence pair and then a classification based on the two sequences. Uh, again, they show, uh, they show this for several tasks. So this is QQP just asks if, if they're both semantically equivalent. Uh, again, several pair classification tasks. So you can do them all just by fine tuning a little bit with, with BERT. They also do sentence tagging, uh, which of course is a bit different. It's a bit different. In this case, you don't need the sentence representation, but you need to tag each individual, uh, each individual uh, token. So what they do is they add an MLP on top of on top of the token and then train that alongside with BERT. Carlos, can I ask questions about BERT's uh, complexity, computational complexity? Uh, so f first, I was wondering, uh, you said you... Wait, sorry, uh, yeah. Yeah, go. Oh, okay. I was just wondering for, uh, for fine-tuning BERT. You said yeah. you can add a layer and then continue the whole thing together, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But is it still not too big for a you know, normal GPU? Even if yeah. you do just one epoch, is, is there no memory problems? Uh, well, there are no memory problems because the, so the whole model is, is not very big. I believe if you get it from TensorFlow Hub, the whole model is about 386 megabytes. So getting the model itself is not, is not very hard. I mean, you, you do need a sizable machine, but, uh, no, but you can't I, I, mean, I mean, for training on the GPU, mem yeah. will GPU memory be enough? Yeah. yeah. In fact, they, they, they say here, do, 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 they put here, uh, so cloud view, a few hours on a GPU starting from the exact same pre-trained model. Uh, so yeah, they, they, they say that you can do it in a GPU and it will only take a few hours because okay. you are fine. Yeah. 
That's nice. Uh, and about inference, uh, mm -hmm. do they talk about inference uh, uh, time or complexity? Because if you deploy a huge model, it might be slow. Or how, how do they talk about it? Um, they they do. So it depends on what you're doing at inference, right? So if you, I, I don't think it would be very slow because of because they're all matrix operations. If you accelerate them by GPU, uh, it is not that many operations that you have to do, and uh, they are highly parallelizable. So I wouldn't think that it's going to be very slow at inference. Um, but again, I guess it depends on, on which resources you're working on. Mm -hmm. If I might add, uh, Bahan, uh, if you check the Electra paper that was presented four weeks ago, I think, they have the numbers for the multiple sizes of birth and the mm -hmm. other new models. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it's slow at inference time compared to small models like CBAL. Yeah. Well, obviously, yeah, but that's okay, I guess. <laughs> So they also make a good point later, which is that they do say that this model, because the attention is, is over the whole sequence, it is going to be slower than, for example, GPT or ELMO. Uh, but they say that the, the gain in performance is so significant that you should take the hit in, uh, in inference time. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, no worries. Uh, Okay, so yeah, uh, with respect to the tasks that they that they do, of course, uh, they show that they well, they basically destroy the state of the art in in uh, in the glue uh, tasks. And in this squad uh, V one point one, which is a very interesting data set, basically you have a, a question and a Wikipedia answer, but the Wikipedia answer is a it's a passage, so it's not a single it's not a single answer. It's a it's a it's a paragraph. And you have to you have to say where the answer starts and when and where the answer ends. So where the answer to the question that you ask starts and ends. They get a bit clever on the on the on the layer that they put on top of the on top of Bert, but uh, well you can you can read it here very quickly. It's not it's not very complex, but they also show that um, that 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 you can get state of the art performance and then you can ensemble Bert and again. Uh, Get state of the art performance on on basically anything that you throw at it, uh, and and that that's mostly the 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 the, the initial results from Bert is that you don't need to train the whole model. Google will provide it for you pre-trained, and then you fine tune to whatever is your uh, your 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 NLP task. And this is a massive advantage over pre-trained embeddings because it means that your embedding your your whole uh, prediction architecture or your whole inference architecture is coupled end to end and you train everything in one day. However, Carlos, so, sorry, yeah. uh, I just saw a raised hand, but I can't really do anything about it. Oh, sorry. Uh, why can't I see it? Ah, yes. Uh, yeah, there you go. Cool. I'm oh. in. Hi, yeah, um, I had a I think it's like a small detail, but um, practically speaking, does it say anything about how um, sentences of variable lengths are dealt with? Like, is it, are they all just padded to the length of the longest one or is that done like per batch or? Yeah, so th that is the, the only, I want to say one of, the, one of the limitations with BERT is that it doesn't handle arbitrary sequences. It, uh, it handles batches, like you say. Uh, the way we'll see, I have a I have a little example that I can show later. But the way you handle the padding uh, da, 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 is with this um, is with this these position embeddings, and uh, we'll see that in Bert you also have a, an input mask, which basically tells Bert where there are embeddings and where there are none. Um, those are, like you said, they are implementation details. Uh, right. I'll get in, in a second. Um, I just wanted to make one final point, which is that sometimes, even if you, so even if you if you have Bird, you cannot fine tune it because, as Vahan said, it's a, it's a big model. Even even so, so it is a big model. So even uh, for some simple task, if you don't have the infrastructure, it might uh, be untractable. 
So they, they make a feature-based approach where, so they have a, a named, uh, this named entity recognition, which is what, uh, what I showed before. So uh, you have a sentence and you have to say uh, what part of the sentence is each thing, if it's, a, if it's an object, if it's a subject, if it's the adverb and so on. So what they did is, well, first of course, they have uh, their state, their previous state of the art approaches. They have their fine tune approach saying, okay, if you train BERT, of course, you're gonna get massive performance. But then they say, okay, say you don't fine tune BERT, but you fix it. So you say, I, I'm just going to take uh, features from BERT. So if you only take the embeddings, you can see that it's not, it's, it's not amazing. So the embeddings trained by BERT are not necessarily good. But then if you start taking the uh, combinations of the hidden representations, uh, you see that the performance comes very close to, uh, to BERT large. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, it, it, it comes very close to the, to the BERT base. So this is the one they recommend the most. If you don't, if you don't have the resources to fine tune BERT, you concatenate the last four hidden layers and use that as your, uh, as your token representation. Uh, so overall, I think it's a, I mean, I think it's a, it's a very interesting uh, approach because it's very versatile, as I said, and, um, and you can achieve state-of-the-art performance. So I am going to show a, a small example, but before that, are there any questions about BERT, the training, the, it will be great to have the URLs for additional reading. It will be useful for being in it. Uh, yeah, so in just before, just before finishing the, the, the session, I'm going to put all the links in the chat and I am also uh, going to put them in the GitHub repo so you can uh, see them either way. And I trained a model for entity salience by fine tuning BERT and not good resource in the limited time I had. So yes, it seems very promising. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, yeah, so, 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 so that's actually interesting. We, we need to, um, so again, with these kinds of models, it's always interesting to, uh, to figure out what things work and what things don't work. Um, but yeah, maybe if you want to, Duane, if you want to give us more details about how you fine tuned BERT, uh, maybe it can give us some, uh, something, just raise your hand if you want to make a comment. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, it was a while ago now, it was just after BERT came out, um, but got a large, uh, large machine, AWS machine, uh, and Docker images to, to uh, uh, running, you know, their images, uh, TensorFlow implementation, uh, uh, and so on and so forth, um, and was doing it as a, oh, what are the details now? Um, Entity salience is the finding of the important um, the, the uh, entities that are most salient to a story, the, the, the names, peoples, companies that are the, the most central to the story, that if you removed them or changed them, the story would lose its meaning. And that was the task I was trying to do and was getting um, better results than the other techniques that I've really tried. Mm. So, you know, by a significant margin. Um, the time sort of ran out, but, uh, and I think I, I did a lot of that code on my own time. So the code that I did on my own time, I'd be happy to share. If you want. Yeah. yeah. So I guess uh, with, with all these things, they, of course, they've had all the time in the world to fine tune their model and uh, make sure that the training task is well, uh, is well defined and so on. So as usual, take results in papers with a grain of salt and uh, always remember that in your in your real life deployment, maybe your data set is not so well behaved, it's not so well defined, maybe your labels are really noisy. So yeah, I, thank you, Duane, for, for, for pointing that out. Any idea the best loss function is for doing sentence classification where the target is ordinal? Huh, that, that, that is a very interesting question. So that there, are, there is an, an ordinal loss that you can, that you can use with uh, TensorFlow. Um, there's something called the Wasserstein distance, uh, or you can, um, uh, yeah. So 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 that's so those are the things that that come to mind uh, just now. 
Uh, one last detail about BERT is that it's optimized using Atom. So I think it's very accessible. So I think that's one of the uh, cool things about BERT is that they do not use like a custom optimizer uh, with different optimiz optimization parts and so on. Um, yeah. Uh, cool. So yeah, fine tuning. Uh, yes. So uh, in the chat, we see that there's hugging face. Yeah. So, so nowadays we have uh, basically two ways that you can digest BERT. One is using hugging face, which is a, a really cool uh, interface. They are, uh, so um, yeah, so, so you have the name in the chat. Um, Hugging face is a, it's a, it's a very transparent, uh, I want to say it's a very clear interface and uh, they encourage you to, to change the code and to adapt their implementations for your training task and to contribute. And the other, the other way is through TensorFlow Hub, which is a bit more obscure. <laughs> I have to, it's not as, as approachable, but also works fairly well. Uh, I wanted to show you, uh, so I, I did this small implementation of BERT. Uh, it is by no means a deployable uh, model, but uh, it's just to show some of the things that you can do. So I am using the TensorFlow Hub version of, of BERT, but if you, do the, if you use the hugging phase one, um, it's very similar. And basically what these libraries provide is a, is a Keras interface to your, uh, to your model. So you can add it as a, as a Keras layer and just compile your model, so build your model. Uh, what's interesting is that if you put it as a Keras layer, you can put more stuff on top, on top of here. So if you want to add an LSTM over your sequence, or you want to add a classifier on, to, on top of your pooled output, you can do it, and that's how you would uh, fine tune the whole thing end to end. Uh, a couple implementation details. Uh, BERT is trained with a very specific vocabulary. So make sure that you're using the right vocabulary when you are doing the tokenization. Uh, like I said, uh, TensorFlow Hub will provide the, uh, what you need to, uh, to, to get the vocabulary. And uh, basically the vocabulary looks uh, like this. It's just all your 30,000 tokens, uh, a bit more. There are some unused tokens. And you have your, your endings uh, for words. Uh, then once, when you tokenize, it is really important that you remember to put the, the beginning character and the separator character. So if your sentence ends, just uh, put the separator. So again, uh, TensorFlow provides the tokenizer that is adequate for BERT. You have to download, uh, this module from TensorFlow, uh, from the, uh, uh, it's a, uh, yeah, from the, from the BERT repo, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's open source. So there's no, there's no problem downloading it. And you can see the tokenized, uh, sentence. So as you can see, the tokenizer is going to do most of the work for you. So you have your CLS character, hello world, and then it's doing the word piece tokenization as well. Uh, so that's cool. And then, uh, I've seen that, so both Hugging Face and TensorFlow, they, they are both an implementation of the TF BERT, so BERT TensorFlow. So the input uh, becomes a bit tricky and I have found that the documentation on it is, uh, is not very good. So the first input you will, you will need is the input IDs. So uh, ah, which have to be of your max sequence length. And this is going to be your, your main limiting here. So you have to choose beforehand what is going to be the maximum length of your sequence. You can do that in any way, but if your sequences are longer than this, you're going to have to uh, separate them and, and, and do your, your training in, uh, with the split sentences. The longer your sequence is, the harder it's going to be to, uh, so the more memory requirement you have because, because you have to pass the whole sequence at the same time through the transformer for it to be efficient. Uh, so your input IDs, uh, input sequence. So in the end, your input sequence is going to look, uh, something like, uh, what's it called? Input sequence. Uh, so your input sequence is going to look something like this. So it's of size, uh, 128. And each of these is, uh, the IDs in the BERT vocabulary. So if I go to, uh, 
slide in 101 here, uh, you'll see that it's the oh, 102 is the is the CLS character. So cool, uh, 102 is the CLS. So there's uh, and then you part with zeros everything else. Then you have your input mask. The input mask is what uh, what I said uh, before. It basically tells Bert where there is a token and where there isn't. So it will assign those uh, position embeddings that we talked about. And it's just ones and zeros saying where there is an input and where there is none. And then you have your segment IDs, which uh, it's either a zero or a one. So in this case, it's only one sentence. Um, but again, if you, if you have two sentences, you have to say which one is the first and which one is the second sentence. Uh, I will put this up in GitHub. So if you want to, to grab this and, uh, and make it pretty, uh, please do. Uh, and otherwise, you, you'll see that you have the, I'm not going to show the whole pulled output, but the, the pulled output is, it's a single 768 size embedding, which is the, the model size for, for bird base. And the sequence output, uh, sequence output shape. It's a tensor with, uh, so this first dimension is going to be your batch size, this is going to be your sequence length, and this is the size of your embedding. So if you take uh, the first one in, in, in here, it's going to be the, the embedding for, uh, for that token. And this pulled output is the embedding for, for the CLS token. Cool. Okay, uh, are there any questions or comments? Has someone used BERT for something interesting other than Dwayne? No? Okay, so uh, there's a question. May we know if we can use the full version of BERT or we need to use the small version of BERT? Uh, you can use the BERT large. Uh, both TensorFlow Hub and Hugging Face provide a uh, provide several different versions of BERT, so you can have the the base and the large, but also you can use a BERT that has been trained with uh, a case vocabulary, so it's not uh, lower case. And uh, yeah, you have uh, you have uh, I think that there are also versions of BERT trained with uh, with other corpus as well. So just be careful that whenever you're using uh, a version of BERT, make sure that you're using the right vocabulary and you're using the right uh, tokens. Uh, otherwise, uh, you're going to get unexpected results. Um, cool. Yeah, no worries. Any more questions? Okay, so if you uh, so I'm going to stop the recording here. Uh, I'm just going to say thank you, everyone. Uh, if you stay a little longer, I'm going to put all the links in the chat. And there's a short poll that I would like to uh, that I would like everyone to say. And just one last thing. So Bert, even if it's only been a year and something that it's been out, there are already further ver versions of Bert. So if Bert is too heavy for your application, there are uh, reduced versions of Bert. So uh, it's called Albert. Um, there's Alberta, there's Roberta, there, there are, uh, there are a, a bunch of different versions of BERT. So I encourage you to look through the BERT documentation. If you would like us to discuss a particular BERT cousin in Paper Club, please do tell us and we'll be more than happy to, uh, uh, to show it as well. Uh, again, they are all implemented in Hugging Face and TensorFlow Hub. So please feel free to use the one that you're more comfortable with. Uh, the main problem is when you don't know the max length of the input sequence. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, if you don't know the maximum length, uh, you can always so you can always split your your sentences, right? If you if your sentences are too long, you can you can figure. So if you have a a, a paragraph that you want to uh, perform some sort some sort of uh, inference on, uh, you could split the paragraph into sentences that fit that fit into your BERT and then use the the output of BERT and put another layer on top. Um, or use just the BERT as a feature. So they do say in the paper that BERT is not necessarily adapted to every NLP uh, task. 
but they do encourage you to use it as a, as a feature-based model as well. Okay, any more questions? Cool, okay, so I am going to stop the recording now and I am going to put all the links